Right. Thank you, Carl. <clears throat> All right. Good evening again. Good to have you. We're going to do a little Bible study here on the gift of life. Um, I, was, I was thinking of something here. I hope you enjoyed your extra minute of daylight today. <laughs> Same as yesterday? When's it start? Tomorrow? Tomorrow it goes up a minute, Gabe just told me. Well, at any rate, I hope you enjoyed your day. <laughs> okay, we, we, uh, we got our first snow this year. Uh, started this afternoon, so it's always a joy. And it's still going, yes. It's supposed to go through 10 o'clock tonight. All right, let's do this. Let's go over to uh, the Gospel of John, please, and chapter number 4. Gospel of John, chapter number 4. I talk, I'd like to talk to you or speak to you about the, the gift of life and see what we can find concerning it here t tonight. Now, a lot of this might be familiar to you, but hang in there because we're going to add a little things to it as we go along, all right? So I'm going to begin in John chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 10 through 14. John chapter 4, 10 through 14. This has to do with the Samaritan woman that the Lord met at the well. You all probably remember that story. Um, but in verse 10 it says, Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Gift of God, you would have been given living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again, for the water that I will give him will become a spring become in him, I'm sorry, in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now what we find here in, in these just four verses or so is that uh, the woman had to be taken from a place of thinking physically to a place of speak, uh, thinking spiritually. She's worried about the water that she came down to the well to collect. All right, but what would, what do we find that the Lord's kind of bringing her over to another way of what we call living water? The Lord called it living water, and this living water would end up, okay, in a in anybody that came to Him and asked for it, a spring of water welling up to what? Eonian life or eternal life. Now it's very important as as we look at this. Slide down to verse twenty one. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know. Talking difference between the Samaritans and the Jewish people. For salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. He is seeking people to worship him how? In spirit and in truth. Say... God is spirit, verse 24, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. That's how God desires to be worshipped. And why does the Lord say that? Is because God is spirit. Now when I come to 25 and 26, the woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. Now look at the grace that the Lord extends to her. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now that's a wonderment to me. It really is. But here the Lord is telling her, I'm who you're looking for. She says, I know that the Messiah is coming. 
the Christ. He says, I am he. So what happened next? Well, we know that the disciples came back and they were surprised he was talking to a woman here at the well. But the woman went where? Well, she went back to the village and she witnessed and told the men there everything that the Lord had told her. Say, everything the Lord had told her. Notice with me 39, and we'll read just down to 42. Many Samaritans from the town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. There you go. She, <laughs> the Lord told her everything that she was, even the amount of husbands she had. And she went and related that to the men at, at the, uh, in town there. And what we find there, as you, as you look at this, they believed because of her testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe for we have heard for ourselves and we know that this indeed is the savior of the world there's a great testimony there in itself isn't it first place we ever see that but slide back to verses 10 and 14 one more time jesus answered her if you knew the gift of god so evidently she didn't know the gift of god did she no. And who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, for he would have given you living water. Now he's going to reveal himself to her before the conversation is finished. Okay? And then, then it says, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you, notice, living water. Then I slide to 14, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Now that's amazing that you read that. So how do you take the living water? What do you take that as? I mean, if we go back to the book of Revelation, coming out of the throne of God is a river, right? A river of water there. And, and so when we, we see this, I believe we can equate it not just to the, the words of God here, but you can equate it to the Spirit of God and the Lord himself, the ones that bring forth this gift to us. The gift of what? Eternal life. It's a free gift. Come back to Romans 5, please. All right, Romans chapter 5, please. And, and let's notice this further. Now, Paul was right in tune with this idea of a gift, you see. So in Romans chapter 5, notice, please, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if many died through one man's trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. So here you have two mentions, again, of a free gift connected with the grace of God. Verse 16, And the free gift is not like the result of that one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass has condemnation, brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. He goes on in 17, For if because of one man's trespass death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Verse 18, Therefore, if one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for whom? All men, the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we see here? This free gift brings forth justification. Notice verse 21, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Justification, righteousness comes as a result of believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is giving a what? A gift. Remember in the Gospel of John, the Lord said, 
my father has life and he's given me that same life to extend to men. And I don't think we can remember, you know, forget that. When I come right over to chapter 6, your next chapter, and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. And I think you know by this time that this is sin death. It's not a physical death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So how many times have we seen it then? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six times we've seen this free gift. This free gift. And what is it? Eternal life. All right? It's eternal life. Uh, flip right over to uh, Ephesians for a moment. Ephesians chapter number 2, please. Okay? Ephesians chapter number 2. And notice, if you would, verse number 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. What is it? It is the gift of God. So Paul's right there in tune with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ that's given to us there. Uh, initially, through the, the Lord's conversations with the woman at the well and then with the men of that town. All right? And so it's a, to me, it's a wonderful thing. But even more than that, does anybody know when that free gift was promised? Any idea? <laughs> okay. Let's go to Titus chapter 1 and verse number 2. Where, I tell you, let me read 1 and 2. Paul, a servant of God and the apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life, which God, who never lies, promised before when? Okay, the ages began or time began. Okay, as, as we see this. So, it's a wonderment to me. So, here we have a gift. So, how is it transmitted to men? That's the question. Well, let's go back to John 5 one more time. All right? John 5 and John 6. One more time. All righty. John 5 and John 6. Notice John 5, first of all. Verse number 24, please. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. All right? So he who hears the word. Verse 26 says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. And so when I compare that with verses 39 and 40, watch what it says. 39 and 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So who is he speaking to here? The hierarchy in the Jewish religion. Pharisees and Sadducees and that sort of thing. But it comes to the uh, 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 transmission of the very scriptures that we see written down for us, okay, that they had. So when I come over to chapter 6, still in John, notice with me please verse 33. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Gift, gives, see this continually popping up? Verse 40, for this is the will of the Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him on that last day. 47. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. And how does a person come to a place of belief? Today, how does it happen? Through the Word of God, right? Through the Scriptures, we would say. So then the thought comes up that people ask. And I don't know if anybody's asked you this in a while, but people ask me, all right? Just what is eternal life? I mean, what is our idea usually of eternal life? Oh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll have life. And when you die, you're going to end up on a cloud with a halo and a harp, right? 
I'd love to learn how to play a harp myself. But at any rate, okay, that's what we see. But if we come over to John chapter 17, we get in the scripture here probably the best definition of Eonian life or eternal life. Verse 3, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. So knowing God, we're looking at the Father here. He is the sender, and Jesus Christ, who was sent. So what is eternal life? It's to know them. Isn't that what it says? And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Remember, the Lord is speaking, praying to his Father here when we see this. So, is it just knowledge? The, the Greek word here is gnosko, okay, which we've done studies on in the past. But Vines says this about gnosko. It indicates a relation between the person knowing and the object known. In this respect, what is known is of value and, and importance to the one who knows. And so who is the one that knows here in verse 3? Well, it's us. To know the Father, to know the Son. And so what's that mean? There has to be a value to that knowledge that we know Him. I mean, to know God, to know our Lord Jesus Christ, what could be a more value than that to a person? Now, now think about that for a while, all right? That's what Mr. Vine is saying that the, the Greek actually means here. It's importance, okay, important to the one who knows. And hence the establishment then of a what? Relationship. And that's what life's all about is relationships. So the greatest relationship any individual could have would be with his creator, isn't it? Sure it is. Watch this. Come over with me to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 8, please. 1 Corinthians 8. All right. 1 Corinthians 8. And watch what we have. I went too far here. Okay. 1 Corinthians 8, just one verse, verse number 3. But if anyone loves God... Now notice, if anyone loves God... Now I don't know... You know, I can't look at anybody and say, well, that person loves God. But who knows that? He is known by God. So what is the value of God to you? Is it a value that you come to love him beyond all else? Now think about it for a while. That you get, you get your mind on spiritual things? Yes, ma'am. Okay, uh, uh, Susan's translation, the Passion Translation, if anyone passionately loves God. I mean, that's, some, that's a goal we should set for ourselves in life. Love him and what will happen? He'll know us, okay? Uh, in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 9, it talks about being known of God. If you turn back with me to Psalm 139, please come over there. Psalm 139. All right, real quickly. Psalm 139. Let's look over here at verse 23. Here, and I believe it's David. Okay, yes it is. Here's David. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Well, I thought God knew everything. But yet, what is David asking God to do? To search him, O God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts. Why would David want to know this? Or allow God to know this? Perhaps so God would know how much David does love him. I mean, these are things you think about, and they go through my mind, mind at least, all right, <laughs> as we see this. So such knowledge, I guess, is what I'm trying to say as I'm coming back to the New Testament. Such knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ is obtained not merely by intellectual activity. 
Paul says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's a heart matter. How much do we really love and care about God? Are we willing to take what he put within us and work it out? That's what this is all about. And if you love him, then it says, he knows you. See? He knows you. So the operation of the Spirit of God working in you, if you allow it, is what brings God to know you is, and you to know him. It's a wonderment. And let me just say this. It's very personal. Come to Galatians with me in chapter 1. Hope I'm not going too fast. But watch Galatians 1 and verses 15 and 16. 15 and 16 say this in Galatians 1. But when he who hath set me apart before I was born, and who called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now, if you have an ESV, you'll notice they have a little footnote there. And you go to the bottom of the page, and it says the Greek is in, not to. Okay? His son in me, in order that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not immediately consult with anyone. He didn't consult with flesh and blood. He went out to the desert, to Arabia, in the next verse, to find God. But he, God was pleased to reveal his son in me, he says. Now, you know, you can take that... Different ways. The Son was in the Lord Jesus Christ. He was indwelt by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what God wanted Paul to do was what? Reveal that. Okay? Reveal that to folks. In the concordant version and the passion version on that verse, it says, To unveil his Son in me. All right? So his son was in him, and it's to be revealed. Revealed what? I'm a believer. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, dwells within me. When I come back, come back to Romans chapter number 8. All right? Romans chapter number 8. And notice with me verses 10 and 11. Now notice what it says very carefully. But if Christ is in you... Now, Paul's writing to the dear saints in Rome, and I think he's trying to get a point across to them here. But if Christ is in you, listen, if Christ is in you, that's a great responsibility. Now, think of it for a while. If Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Remember what we, we saw over there in, in John, chapter 4, chapter 6? Romans chapter 5, chapter 6, okay? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus, or Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. This has nothing to do here with the resurrection. This has to do with your current state and relationship with our great God and Savior. Right now, he can vivify your mortal bodies in order for you to do what? What did Paul do? He revealed his son. So God can give us the strength. I mean, Paul is the one that says, man, I die daily. All these things are happening uh, to me. But yet, what happened? He had the strength in him, given to him by God, to strengthen his mortal body to do what God wanted to be done. See? It's a wonderment. So I go to 2 Corinthians and chapter number 13. Please go over there. All right? And watch what it says here. 2 Corinthians 13. All right, 13 and verse number 5. Here Paul tells these saints, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? I wonder how many modern-day saints that live in our generation realize the fact of the matter that Jesus Christ is in them. I mean, I take that for granted. I've taught that. I was taught that. See? And to me, it's, it's probably the most wonderful thing in the world. 
knowing that Jesus Christ is in me. And here Paul is, is trying to do what? He says, unless indeed you fail to meet the test. They, you know, in other words, if they didn't realize that Christ was in them as Paul had taught them, then they failed the test. All right? God is zero in, in, their, in their tests. So that brings me to, well, I don't even have to turn there. In Colossians 1, 27, Paul talks a mystery of Christ. Colossians 1, 27. And what is the mystery of Christ? Christ in you. Thank you. All right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Which brings us back over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, please. Now watch what happens here. Very familiar verse. I probably have used this in our last four or five Bible studies. Verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. Period. It is no longer I who live. So what's Paul saying there? When he says it's no longer I who live. I was crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. What's he saying? I mean, if, 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 <laughs> if I told you I no longer live, you would have to assume that I was in the ground. Well, that's not the idea here. Paul's saying, I no longer live. What's he saying? <laughs> but Christ, who lives in me, and who is life? Christ is life. What has Christ done? He gave his life. He went to the grave. He was raised from the dead. He, he ascended. He gave himself on behalf of mankind. He told us, and we've studied this in the last few weeks, you know, especially in, in the book of John and other places, that, hey, the Father dwells there. I dwell there. We're one, and you are one. Say. He is, we are in him, and he is in us. It's Christ who lives in me. So the life I live now, okay, the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself what? For me. So the life I, I now live, I live in what? See, he says, the life I now live in the flesh. But he was crucified, so he no longer lives right? Christ dwells within him. And that life I live now, because it can be mortified, Romans chapter 8, verse 11, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Do you realize snow out there, right? <laughs> A lot of snow. What's going to happen eventually this winter is we're going to have so much snow, it's going to shut everything down. You won't have anything to do at home but watch TV. All right? But you know what? If you have a concordance at home, and I hope all you believers have a concordance at home, you can go and look about being in Christ. And you know what you're going to find? 137 passages that declare to the believer the indwelling of the Lord Jesus Christ in a believer. Do you think after repeating that 137 times in the New Testament that God, that that means something to God? That he's trying to get something across to us as believers, his son? So you say, well, Brother Dan, what's all this mean? Well, watch this. Come to the fifth chapter again of 2 Corinthians. All right. Second Corinthians, chapter 5. Familiar verse again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation or a new creature. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has what? Has come. Present tense. Has come, not coming. The old passed away. The old man Paul talks about in Ephesians, Colossians, all right? And the new has come. Now, what has come that's new? This new creation. In the Greek, the word for new, there's a couple of them, but the one used here is Kane, K-A-I-N-E, 
all right? K-A-I-N-E. Now, now listen to this very carefully. From Thayer's Greek lexicon, what this Greek word means is this. New, recently made, fresh, recent, unused, unworn, of a new kind, novel, uncommon, of unheard of. So when I read here, the new has come in relationship to the new creation, what are we talking about? We're talking about something that God did for you because of the gift he gave you. He made you brand new. Over the years, I've heard so much, this statement so much, oh, Brother Dan, I am what I am, I can't change. From believers. So does that mean what God put in you is worthless? When he says what? He says it's new, okay? Recently made, fresh, recent, <laughs> unused, unworn. It is brand new. Now watch this. Let me compare it with something. There's another word for new in the scripture. It's neos, N-E-O-S. But that's not used here. The Cain word is used. It's brand new. What's brand new? What's in you? That new creation. Nuos means this. It would have meant that we are no more than a makeover. In other words, as you look it up in your concordance and you, and you can go see that. I'm not a makeover. God didn't take the old and try to mix, you know, the, the uh, uh, story of the, uh, uh, the potter and the clay. See? That's not applied here. We're brand new, not makeovers, if you please. It's a wonderment as you look at this. So I'm going to go back to John chapter number 4 one more time. Please come back there with me. John chapter 4. Okay. John chapter 4. Notice with me one more time verse 14. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. Why is that? Because it's the Lord himself that dwells in you. The thirst is not a physical thirst. It's a spiritual thirst. Okay? A spiritual thirst. The water that I will give him will become in him a what? Spring of water. When, when I was at a lighthouse in Upper Michigan, Keweenaw Peninsula... Uh, there was one made road going up the peninsula. It was all hills and mountains, <laughs> right? And once we got off that main road, we had to take a road about seven or eight miles, I guess it was, and, you know, from top of my mind, over to Eagle Harbor, Michigan, where the lighthouse was in the little community of Eagle Harbor. But, you know, halfway, halfway to Eagle Harbor from the main road there, all right, you would go, and there'd always be a line of cars along the side of the road, Remember what that was, Susan? <laughs> there was a pipe driven into the rocks. Spring of water, always flowing. Summer, winter, didn't matter. And that's where people went to get their water, their drinking water. And that, as I, every time I read this verse, that's what I think of. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, the it never stops. It's always there. Why? Because we're new. You're not just saved, but also you're completely new and totally different. Why is that, Brother Dan? Because our Lord Jesus Christ dwells in you. What could be a better gift? And by the way, it was a free gift <laughs> than to realize that our Lord Jesus Christ dwells within us. Keep that in mind for the new year. Every day should be before you. He dwells in you. And the next time you want to get mad at a saint, I want you to remember this. <laughs> or anybody else. It really doesn't matter. Remember this. Jesus Christ dwells in me. How would he react? When it comes times of love and manifest love to somebody, don't do it in the flesh. Realize, hey, Jesus Christ dwells within me. How would he do this? 
this is what we need to be because that's a true fellowship of knowing God the Father and his Son. That is eternal life. So God bless you. Let's sing a couple more songs. All right. Carl, are we all ready? Yes, sir.